Hello and welcome. Today we have a very special treat for you all. My dear friend Mason, he started out working in a nursing home. And then from that he worked his way up to being an EMT, got himself educated, and became a paramedic. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Mason. How you doing, Mason? Doing all right, Jake. How about you? Thanks for having me on your show today. No problem. So let's uh, let's hear a little bit about your story. Um, let's take it back to when you were in high school. Actually, back when I was in high school, the the first job I had was over at the nursing home. That was pretty bad. It's a pretty miserable place. Um, what made you leave? What made me leave? I don't know. I wasn't really a fan of the way everything, you know, nursing home works and everything. It was just kind of dark and depressing and really wasn't my type of thing. But... Uh, since I was still in high school, I knew that's not where I wanted to end up being. So uh, I ended up taking my CFR and EMT. What is CFR an acronym for? CFR is just like a subsection of EMT. Pretty much do a lot of the same thing, except for you can't immobilize or splint. Can't really give drugs or anything like that. How did you get certified for that? Yeah, you just take a class for, I think it was like three months. But after I did that, the following year I ended up taking EMT. Ran with EMT for a little bit, and then I realized that, you know, there was more I could do for people. So I ended up going back to school and getting my paramedic. Paramedic teaches you a whole lot, you know. You know, things that you wouldn't realize that you could actually do. You're doing things that, you know, really, the only other people that can do it are physicians and whatnot. So being the kind of people's last, last hope before, you know, things end up getting uh, totally out of hand. You started out in the fire department. So when you were joining the fire department and doing all the training, did you have any inclinations on being an EMT? No, actually, back when I first started, I was 16 in my local fire department, um, and I had no desire or aspiration to be an EMT. I was just strictly there for the fire stuff. You know, I wanted to be the guy that was ripping apart cars and kicking in doors and you know, crawling through flames. I ended up taking my very first CPR course, and I was so happy when I ended up passing it, and I, you know, went to the fire station and was telling all the guys, you know, that were EMTs and whatnot, and I've actually done CPR before. You know, I told them how I had my card now, and I passed and everything. And uh, once I got to that checkpoint, you know, I got, it was, C, you know, CPR is just such a very, um, very simple skill to learn, uh, but it gave me some sense of, like, pride that I could do it. So from that point on, pretty much... Uh, that just kind of sparked me wanting to carry on and continue to get the rest of my certifications and eventually take me all the way to paramedic. So at at first I had no aspiration to be an EMT and then just kind of stumbled upon it and I you know definitely um definitely don't regret it. So fireman was for more so the adrenaline. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then the and then the EMT was seeing a family member and just people that you know needing assistance and not being able to provide it to them. Yeah, yeah. It's uh. When you when you realize what you know, how important the role of is uh, for EMTs and paramedics, what it, what a genuine difference they can make, you know, in saving someone's life. You no, know, in comparison to just someone driving themselves to the hospital or whatnot, you know, it's really a, really a driving factor. Knowing you know that you ultimately do make the difference. I remember being friends with you in high school was a very unique experience because it wouldn't be we just hang out and you know we we drink and just have fun. That was more middle school. <laughs> and then you'd be asleep, 3 a.m., just went to bed a half hour before that, then suddenly I hear, beep, 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 beep. And then Mason would be rushing to get up, and suddenly he'd just have to leave and go to a call because he had a little pager they would always sleep next to. And there were a few times that we would be hanging out together. We'd be at a restaurant or something. And then suddenly Mason's pager would go off. He was the one driving, so I'd just have to be there going to the call with him and you know before he had light bars and everything so people got out of his way <laughs> he would turn on his four-way flashers because he thought that people would care and not just think he has like a flat tire or something so he turns on his four-way flashers trying to you know rush to the scene and no one's getting out of his way no one cares because no one knows so that was a very unique experience do you miss the fire department? I know you're involved in one still, just not as heavily, but do you miss it being basically your full-time gig? Oh, uh, yeah. When I when I think back, you know, I'd, 
I do miss just that being like the, you know, my, my primary function. It's a more well-known thing. People look at the fire department. No one, no one really knows what EMS is and the aspect of fire. They're kind of like the forgotten ones because you watch the news, you know, the people on TV, movies, shows. It's always the firemen, you know. It's never really the EMTs and the paramedics and the ambulance. No one, everyone kind of seems to forget about them. So, yeah, you know, it's there's a whole lot more to do with fire, it seems, in the aspect of training-wise and whatnot. You know, you could... One day you can be tearing apart a car, doing a, a live burn, going over extrications, you know, rescue techniques and whatnot. In EMS, there's really not too much practice you can do not on a legitimate person. Trainings are generally more fun for fire, and I, I do miss doing a lot of the trainings. But other than that, you know, you, you still get to partake in a lot of it still. The experience of being an EMT, would you call that a humbling experience? Because <laughs> it's more work and less gratitude. <laughs> Yeah, doing what I do now in comparison to the past, it's definitely a uh, humbling experience. Back when I first started, I thought it was all just hero stuff. You know, you you do all these crazy life saving things, and it was a it was a big jump from, you know, working at the gas station, working in a nursing home, you know, just simply cooking food and whatnot, into doing what I do now. Um, really gives you a different uh, appreciation for life, seeing how fragile it really is. But yeah, it's definitely, definitely humbling, you know, because you wake up and, you know, you just think it's going to be another average day and you end up doing something that, you know, you never thought you would. You, know, you can't anticipate the day. It's not like you're going to get up, get to work, you know, clock in, sit down at your desk, you know, start rifling through your papers. You could walk in, punch in, go out for breakfast, and then five minutes later be going to a 20-car pile up. So there's really no way to prepare for it. It's just kind of rolling off of, you know, what you what you learned and what you've done in the past. So it's definitely uh, definitely humbling knowing that uh, you kind of have to improvise as you go. Yeah, I, I agree. There's less gratitude. Fire, EMS, and police are essentially the textbook definition of a sheepdog because they're the ones that are there. You guys are waiting in the station for the masses of sheep to have an emergency and then call you. But then 364 days out of the year, they don't think about you guys once. No. You know, I rarely give you thanks. Essentially a, a very sheepdogish type job. Everyone that pretty much does this doesn't really care about the thanks. I mean, it's, it's in my personal opinion, I think it's awkward when you get thanked. Because to me, it's not, you know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't hold the door for you. I didn't, um, I wasn't standing behind you in line, you know, getting coffee in the morning and, you know, you're, yeah, you just you're a dollar you just short. Them dying. Yeah. You, it's know, you not, didn't do much. <laughs> I'm not saying that I didn't do much, but I'm not for a thanks. You know, it's not like, you know, where in, for instance, you're walking into the store and someone holds the door up for you. You're like, oh, no, thank you. Because you didn't have to do that. We all kind of morally have uh, an obligation, you know, inside of us to do the right thing. And we're not looking for a thanks. It's just, you know, something that, in our minds, we feel like it's the right thing to do, and uh, there has to be someone that can do it. Not a lot of people can do it, so that's where we get it from. It really takes like a special person to do that because it, it's a lot of work, and it's very mentally straining. And it's not like you are a doctor where it's the same. It's a lot of work and mentally straining, but you get a very nice big paycheck at the end of the day. You're not making a boatload of money doing this. So the people who do it go into it knowing that. They don't do it for the money. They don't do it for the hero status. They do it because it's just what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah, no, the uh, EMS pretty much all over America is not, not at the top of the pay scale, not even close. And that causes a lot of problems for people, like the uh, the burnout rate for EMS is only a handful of years. So... You know, people people get into this thinking that, you know, it's one thing, it's the pay is one thing, and everything about it is one way. And then you realize it's the total opposite. Do you ever regret doing it? Because you didn't go to you didn't go to any universities, you know, you didn't even really take general sciences or maths. You you went to a, a specialized school that has a program where they, they teach these trades. And they, they teach these skills. Do you ever regret doing it? You are now the age where a lot of your friends will be graduating within the next year. They have degrees, specialized degrees, and they're going to be making more than you. You know, do you ever do you ever regret not going to school and not doing something 
maybe more financially rewarding well no not not exactly because i mean yeah you're right a, a good majority of our friends you know that we you know we grew up with and whatnot are going to be getting this degree as if that you know if they already don't have the degree um and do have the potential to get a job that does have a higher pay rate and by no means you know do do paramedics not make enough money like i i most definitely make enough money and you know there's always always the potential to go to other agencies and whatnot and seeing as my career path is a very um understaffed career path you know they're they're always hurting everywhere so uh wages can be very competitive you know you go from one agency to another and you know if an agency is hurting for providers bad enough they will uh they will definitely compensate and pay if they need you bad enough but uh no, I mean I can I could definitely say that I would rather uh I'd rather stick to the path that I chose than go back and get a degree in something else because you know what what my career path lacks financially and uh benefits wise it uh definitely pays for in the moral aspect in the pride, you know, cuz th- that's something that you can't get from working, you know, another job in my mind. Not to sound too too romantic with you. <laughs> but um, no, honestly, it it takes a very special kind of person because you guys work long shifts and aren't rewarded, you know, very much at the end of the week uh, with paychecks. You guys, you know, you guys get by, but you're not going to have a tremendous amount of luxuries in life. Honestly, it's it's funny because first impressions of you with everybody I've ever known that's met you, they've always been asshole or <laughs> or fucking dickhead. You know, arrogant, rude, uh, narrow-minded, and, and careless. But the reason, and I've spoken to my girlfriend about this, truth be told. <laughs> the reason I have always been good friends with you is because you are the epitome of all action, no talk. It's not talk because, he, I don't know. Let me ask you, is it a filter? You say these things that are just so blatantly arrogant. You act this way that's so offensive. Is this just like a filter to see who's really, who's really in it with you, or what is it? Because first impressions, you are never good, ever. <laughs> it's not until people get to know you. My own mother despised you for years, yeah. <laughs> for years, and you still do things that make her despise you. But you know, she's very fond of you. Um. No, I think I'm just at the point where, I mean, our, in our generation in specific, I just don't care. You have I, been like that since <laughs> I've met you, and we were not even 15. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I just never cared. Um, no, because in my mind, you know, if you, if you, couldn't, if you couldn't take the honesty, then um, why should the world cater to you? I mean, and, and, I, and I still feel that way. Uh, you know, aside from, you know, who I am professionally, you know, out, out in the normal world, um, I never felt the need to sugarcoat things ever. You know, growing up, you know, you know that, you know, our friends would go out places and I can't tell you how many enemies I made. I mean, you know, you know that. So there's really no need to explain that. To you. Um, I was very hated growing up. No, I feel like our generation is still different from the current one. I can only imagine how many people would hate me nowadays. But, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I think one person liked you in your generation when you were growing yeah, up. Yeah, and you're sitting across from me, so congratulations. If you in your generation, you probably have no one. <laughs> no. Um, no, I, I don't know. It was just, uh, I guess, like, I grew up rough, you know, at home and all around and us constantly running around when we were kids, you know, in town, skating, doing stupid stuff, going out on adventures out in the woods. Um I guess we really never found a way to to sugarcoat things for the rest of the rest of uh, our friend group. So that's that, that's very true. I, <laughs> because for the, for the most part, when you're friends with somebody and they piss you off, yeah. I mean, for me and you, I could just be a douchebag to you whenever I please, and you yeah. would just fire right back at me. It, but I I sometimes forget that I can't just do that to the uh, to the average person when they mouth off. Yeah, I probably should uh, be a little more uh, tactful. I think you would you'd it's probably the best way to put it. We have been more rude to each other than we've been nice. We, I, I went over to Mason's place tonight to record this episode, and we haven't seen each other in months. Since Christmas, and, actually. Yeah, and the first thing we say to each other is, 
not very nice. You know, it's not, oh, I'm so glad to see you. It's, you're a fucking bitch. You know, and that just means it's nice to see you. I I'm guess. pretty sure it was, what's up, bitch? <laughs> what's up, bitch? <laughs> you know, the reason I've been friends with you is because it, it, it's challenging to be so fake with people and suppress so many thoughts. <laughs> but it, it's just good to, it's just good to be real with somebody when they piss you off to call them a pussy. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's just weird because it, I, to be honest, it is, it is the people who are the most honest, who are the most genuine and real because you know, whatever they're telling you is sincere. Yeah. In, in, in real. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, in my personal opinion, if you don't care what people think of you, what do you need to lie for? That's a good point. Yeah. I and mean, I, that's pretty much been my philosophy growing up and that's probably why I didn't get along with so many people. The nicest way you've been the most <laughs> honest guy I've ever known. <laughs> Yeah, but back to back to paramedic and because um, you are a paramedic now, would you recommend this career path for the average <laughs> show or for anybody? I mean, what does it what does it really take to be this? It uh, it takes it takes a lot. You have to be you know physically and mentally tough. I mean, you know, because you're you're gonna see and do things you know that the average person never ever 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 will. It takes a lot of patience and. Steady hands, you know, for all the fine stuff it to do, IVs and intubations and, you know, everything. Of course, I recommend it to people, uh, but just don't be too discouraged, you know, if you if you realize that it's not for you because it's it's not like what it seems on TV, not even close. And there's really no way to prepare for it until you're actually sitting in that seat, you know, wearing the uniform with a little badge on your chest saying, you know, who you are. You know, it's, it, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it to people. I hate when people ask, you know, you know, uh, tell me about what you do or whatever, because it's, well, that's this entire podcast. I know, so. I know. And it's been a struggle. I hate you too. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I suggest it. It's just, don't be discouraged if you realize that it's not, you know, it's not what you thought it was or it's not for you because a lot of people end up running into that. What personality type would you suggest somebody to have to <laughs> do this? You definitely have to have a type a personality but you have to know when to control that type a because you can't be you have to be the leader but at the same time if there's another agency you know whether it be fire police whatever there you while you know that you know you're in charge of the scene patient care whatever it might be you still have to respect their opinions and take some of them into consideration you know because they're ultimately there to help you too. And their organization does have to have a leader also, just like yours does. So while you have to be type A, you also kind of have to be type B momentarily just to get the point across and kind of come to a determination together and then go back to being, you know, the leader that you're supposed to be. So. So there's no room for pride. You can't no. be prideful in the field. No, not not in the field. You can't be, you Especially know. Yeah, if someone's life depends on it. Yeah, obviously. you have to put your your pride aside definitely in the moment. You know, be proud of what you did afterwards, but all emotions have to go out the window when you're there in the moment for sure. If you couldn't be, if you weren't a paramedic, what would you be? If there's one thing you could be <laughs> besides that, what would you be? Uh, if I if I could be anything else, but what I am right now, I'd definitely say uh, I want to be an infantryman. Why is that? I would be an infantryman because it's a, it's a, it's a prideful thing. Um, runs in my family, you know, I, you know, many generations of infantry and, you know, you're the, you're the fighting spirit of America. Um, I'm very patriotic, you know, incredibly patriotic. <laughs> you know, <Not> that. Really. <laughs> you know that, um, and it's just the right thing to do. I, I personally feel like, you know, every abled body male and, you know, and I know in today's society we have to, you know, Everyone's the same now, so I'll just say every able body American citizen should have to do some sort of time and service, you know, whether whether you want to be the tip of the spear and, you know, be the infantryman or the scout or the tanker, whoever you wanna be, or you wanna be, you know, behind the line doing um, you know, ordinance or some sort of uh, you know, training you want to be in the healthcare field, you know, but not out on the front line. You want to be in a hospital or in wherever, back at base. You know, everyone, everyone should have to do something. It's just a personal belief, simply because you know it's, it's definitely you know in this generation seen as a, uh, 
as a very bad thing to be in the military. And it, I don't know where that sudden change came from because, you know, years and years and years ago, like our grandparents, it was seen as a very, uh, very noble thing to do. So I don't know where we went wrong, but I feel like that might fix it a little bit. If everyone had to do something to uh, do their part, you know, it might change people's minds about what the military is really about. So what, what would you say your philosophy in life is then? Because it's hard to pin down because... What what is what is your religion exactly? I I don't want to just say blatantly, but could you say you're agnostic, atheist, or you Christian or Catholic or what are you Jewish? <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea to be honest. Um, so you just don't know. But... I really don't know, and it's not really as, as awful as it sounds to say. It's not on my top priority. I mean, I suppose uh, I should probably figure that out someday. Here's to hoping that there's something better than uh, than the average uh, the average life, you know. Hopefully, after all of these years of working and running around and whatnot, there really is that uh, everlasting peace. But uh, I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get there. You seem peaceful now. Oh. I mean, what's wrong with you now? <laughs> but yeah, okay. So I mean, you, I, I would, I would, I would put you in the category of agnostic then, because you, you don't know what you believe, but you believe there's something. Nobody knows what actually happens when you die and what life is, but you feel like there's some sort of bigger meaning out there. Okay. Right? So is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so I, I, I would definitely put you in that category. Uh, so it, it's just so strange because you're such a honest man and don't spare feelings. Uh, yet you do something very <laughs> selfless at the same time for the most of your most of your year every year you're doing something very selfless because the only job you did that wasn't selfless was working at a gas station I mean working <laughs> at a nursing home selfless working in the fire department volunteering actually for free yeah yeah it wasn't paid uh, it was. call that selfless EMT selfless paramedic selfless then at the same time you have like a lot of enemies. So what would you what would you say is your like meaning to life and what is it about? Because it doesn't. You're a very controversial character, and <laughs> what judges like a, what makes a person good and like would make them like go to heaven, so to speak. <laughs> just just pause like five. Seconds. I just want to know what added on this is your fine. Um, you know, I really wish I could tell you. I mean, I I really don't know. Would you say it's about just doing good deeds, doing something good for humanity? I, I just can't pin it down. I guess you can't even pin it down. You don't even know. You're just going throughout life and doing shit and not knowing why. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd say my 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 personal belief in driving point, I guess, is to always just do the right thing. But you, um, but that, that's the problem. Know, that's why it's hard to pin I, down I know, because just, you, you don't, you don't often do I'm the such right a thing. Bastard. I know. You I go against what the right thing is. You know. Fine, fine, fine. We'll we'll look at it this way. The world has good people and bad people, and you're um, both though. I mean, that's the thing I don't <laughs> fine, get is fine. because no, you no, will, you will go and like destroy someone emotionally, but then you'll go the next day, and if they're if they're needing help, you will save their life or like you have to do anything for them. Like such a it's a fact. I'm not editing this out. That that is a fact. You will go and. Upset the shit out of anybody, but then if they need something that is important, you'll be one of the very few who would be there, if not the only. Well, so I don't know. I, You're like a bipolar. I'm most definitely not bipolar. No, no, no. Bipolar and what your life philosophy is. You know, it's such a hard. I would definitely just say. I mean, my my driving factor is to always do the right thing, but at the same time, but at the same time, I, don't, I don't care sense. about your opinion. I feel like this. this how is a, I feel like this because even if somebody doesn't say something to you, you will be pretty I'm brutal. Never just to, a douchebag to anyone for no reason. Well, maybe you should look in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, you say your life philosophy is to do the right thing, but then the other eighty percent of the time you're not. It's like when it comes to the big, you do the big things, the very, <laughs> the very large things that matter and make a difference. But when it comes to like the medium or the small things. <laughs> You are nowhere to be seen for the most part. I'm going to be honest, Mason. When's the last time I was upset and I went and talked to you and you were like, it's going to be okay, Jake. Or did every time that happened, you went, don't be a pussy. 
you contradict yourself. I don't know if you are a, a good, caring soul or if you are someone who just, I don't even want to say. It's, it's not, I don't want to say it's about my best friend, but, you know, someone who's not a very good, caring soul. Why do you contradict? I guess you should figure out first, but who are you? <laughs> well, damn. I mean, uh, even though you're kind of a douchebag right there, I mean, I still, no. Um... That's what I mean, guys. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I always do the right thing. I mean, in reality, I, I definitely do the right thing. I understand your life philosophy now. <laughs> And, and the premise of your life philosophy is delusion. <laughs> is that what it is? No. Um, Maybe you're just straight up a good person then because I, I, you're doing the right thing and not knowing I, why you're doing it. That's the thing. I, I try to be a good person, you know. No, you don't try. <laughs> it just comes is, naturally. <laughs> you, you don't try, but when push comes to shove and it needs to be, you you know, you do it. Yes. So, you know what? You're right. You're, you're right. You, you got me. I will always do the right thing in someone's time of need. No, we need to agree. It's not always, though. It's, it's when it's I like, Fine, 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 fine. When I will do the right thing in someone's time of need, but... The last-ditch effort, <laughs> when it needs to be done, you do it. You're, you, you're, you're a, so full of shit. You're a doer. One of my favorite teachers back in uh, high school said, don't let people figure you out because they get bored. So I suppose I'm just trying to keep people wondering... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, now that now that you brought that up, now I'm starting to wonder, am I really just an <laughs> asshole? <laughs> you played that character so well, now you don't even know. Think. Everything I know is just wrong. I'm just a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> all in all, you're you're a good soul. So, you know, deep down, deep down, I'm probably a, <laughs> a good person somewhere. <laughs> it's got to be in like the fourth dimension inside <laughs> of you. As if you go down to the core, it's tough to find. Speaking of life philosophies, did you hear about Stephen Hawking's death? Yeah, it is, it's kind of awful. It took, it took me by surprise, actually. I, um, I, not expecting that. I even realized how, how old he actually was. He was in his 70s, I believe. Right, with Lou Gehrig's disease. Yeah, I mean, uh, he, he lived definitely a long, good life. Um, I mean, he was definitely dealt, obviously, some bad cards, you know, a lot of good cards that but a lot of people would wish they were dealt. But, uh, yeah, no, the, his death is definitely uh, definitely tragic. But, uh, you know, the, the world definitely benefited greatly from him. So, you know, what more can you ask for? It seems like as soon as you forget about somebody, they die. I swear, the second <laughs> that I forgot about David Bowie, I forgot about Stephen Hawking's, you name it, and they die. It's almost, it's a publicity stunt. <laughs> Not really, but, yeah. you know, you don't think about Stephen Hawking's for a few months and suddenly you see him on trending news, you know, he's <laughs> dead. Doesn't make any sense. It's sad, you know, it's sad to see him go. But I think that I know I talked about him in the last episode, but he's such an influential person. It's good that we have Elon Musk. We got a healthy, strapping, young, intelligent, ambitious man to really take his place. No, I don't I don't think anyone could ever take his place. I mean, Aunt Granin, you know, Musk is a very smart individual. I mean, I feel like Hawking was on a totally different level. I don't know because <clears throat> I look at Hawking's more so as a as a philosopher, like Socrates. But I look I look at Musk as um, yeah. uh, I look at Musk as more of like an Isaac Newton who who uses it in an implied version. Yeah, he sort of he has the same mentality as you, except <laughs> a bright, whole lot smarter, <laughs> a whole lot smarter. He has like ambition and everything to wanting to do good for everybody. Yeah. It's that X factor that you both have, but hey, maybe I'll be the next genius. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get too far. Let's just yeah, stick no. <laughs> with stick with paramedic. You know, it's what you like. All right, Mason, thank you for coming on. Was it nice? Yeah, it was an experience. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> Jesus. That is all, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to that is nice. All right, insert the the claps now and whatnot. <laughs> Woo. All the fans here. This did bring a game. Happy I am afraid. When I need a need a room, give me a pee my bed. Wait my door and my double cup. Then some turn it up. Gonna be a show, then I'm gonna fuck.